Good afternoon. This session is titled Gender and Race Redux, Redux, Identifying and Fixing the Racist and Sexist Realities of the Animal Protection and Rights and Law Movement. It's a tough subject. It's something that we don't really want to look at uh, or admit is happening in our movement, but it is. Uh, there's an old saying that in order to do good, we must first do well. And for me, that means that within the animal rights, animal protection movements, we must act ethically and compassionately toward other humans as well as toward animals. Um, in the animal rights movement, we like to think of ourselves as the ones who hear the cries of the defenseless. And our focus on animals is first and foremost, but sometimes it blinds us to the hurtful and shoddy treatment we give to other humans, especially women and people of color. The reality is that too often we excuse the wrongdoings of our colleagues, often people in positions of power, often men in the case of women, who treat their employees and their volunteers with disrespect and downright cruelty. It's dishonest to argue that we should put aside our own well-being because, hey, we're all in this for the animals. Our movement is losing some of its best and brightest, and that harms both the movement and the animals we seek to serve. So this panel is going to discuss what we realize, as I said, is a painful and awkward topic, and we hope that each of you uh, will take it to heart and will open yourselves up, hear what these folks are saying, and ask yourselves, what can you do to challenge this problem? Dear Harvey Weinstein, <laughs> it's been a tough week, hasn't it? But why did it take so long? And who looked the other way to enable you to do what you've been doing for so long? Didn't your mom teach you better? We've got to be better. This is not going to go away by itself. So I'd like to introduce our distinguished speakers. Our first speaker is Jennifer Fearing. If you live in California and you're involved in any way with animal protection, you know who Jennifer is. The California legislature is her domain. She hit the ground running as a representative of the HSUS back in 2008. She was instrumental in running the successful Prop 2 campaign, ballot campaign in California. And she's been in the driver's seat for more than 80 positive legislative and regulatory outcomes in the California legislature. In 2014, she opened her own Sacramento-based agency, Fearless Advocacy, where she continues her high-profile work. Following Jennifer is another straight shooter, Lauren Ornelas. Sorry, Lauren. <laughs> Many people have read about Lauren. She's somewhat mythical. Um, she's the person who cornered John Mackey, the founder of Whole Foods, and convinced him to become a vegan. Um, and because of that relationship, and because she is such a straight shooter who you can trust, Whole Foods went, underwent a lengthy internal self-analysis and process and committed itself to humane practices. Lauren is also credited with helping to persuade Trader Joe's to stop selling all duck meat. She's been in the animal rights movement for 30 years. Uh, she was the former executor Executor? No, executive director of Viva USA, a California-based group, which, I'm sorry, and, and for 10 years, and, and for the last 10 years, she's been with the Food Empowerment Project, which she founded and she leads. The Food Empowerment Project puts the spotlight on the abuse of farmed animals, unfair working conditions for the people who work with those animals as well as with produce, and the unavailability of healthy foods in low-income areas. They're trying to establish that healthier food choices are the rights of all people, and that that will help bring about a more compassionate society. You can catch Lauren on TEDx talking about the power of our food choices. Our final panelist is Carolyn Walker 
an attorney and partner with the Portland firm of Stoll Reeves. She specializes in labor and employment matters. Her extensive experience includes litigating and counseling clients on a wide variety of employment matters, including wrongful discharge, claims based on race, ethnic origin, gender, age, and religion, sexual and racial harassment, and other legal claims in the employment context. She has represented clients in jury trials, arbitrations, mediations, and before administrative agencies, including the Equal, Oppor Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and the Oregon Bureau of Labor and Industries. Carolyn represents employers across all industries with a special concentration in the areas of health care, higher education, agriculture, and energy. We are pleased to have each of these experts with us today. Please give them a welcoming round of applause. Thank you, Joyce. Um, she said, my name is Jennifer Fearing, and I am, I guess I'm pleased to be here. If, if someone was going to have to get up and talk about this topic, I think one of us who's been in this movement, I'm going on 15 to 20 years at this point, um, I, I really feel like, particularly given the uh, setup the Hollywood provided for me this week, it's the, it's the right moment, and I hope all of you are as sort of hungry to talk about this as I think our, um, I can tell you the women in your life are hungry to talk about this topic and look for ways that we can all do better. And it's also clear to me that uh, when women rule the world, the thermostats in conference rooms like this will be <laughs> elevated. We will get right on that. So I uh, am not a woman's studies major. I am not an HR expert. I am a feminist, but I have become a reluctant and frustrated avenger for gender equality in our movement and a spokesperson where I can be against discrimination and harassment of our women. I, I, I am just one of those women trying to make an impact to reduce as much animal suffering I can with the skills and interests that I possess. And I think we should all be free to express those skills and interests to the best of our ability and with all of our energy and passion. When Joyce asked me to do this, I figured she probably is checking out my tweets because I'm regularly railing on someone about an issue like this. But I told her it would be really important to me to spend the time we have together focusing on practical advice very practical advice for men and women in this movement, whether you're a volunteer, uh, a staff person, a donor, a board member, or an executive, that there might be some nugget in things I could share based on my personal experiences and those of the men and women in our movement who were kind enough to give me some of their thoughts as I prepared for this, that there'd be something in there that we could all walk out of this room with an ability to do a little better by our sisters in the movement. So we do lack gender parity at the leadership level in this, in this movement. Um, across 18 leading organizations, the men, the male CEOs outnumber the females 14 to 4. And that disparity is even more pronounced if we were to account for the financial resources that these organizations each have. There's a less distracting version that makes the same point. This is the same organizations, but when you look at the CEOs and the board chairs of those organizations, the male, out, the male CEOs and board chairs, number 25, the women nine, that's a 74% male um, leadership domination. And these stats are jarring, if not surprising. I mean, we're all well aware of the glass ceiling for women that exists for all sectors and all industries. But I find it a head scratcher for a movement that's dominated by women at every level. I mean, I'm looking around this room, this, the, the academic evidence tells us 68 to 80% of women in the animal rights movement are female, and that, look around the room. I think that's about what we have present here today. I mean, it's obvious within the first five minutes in this movement that the ladies are getting shit done. Um, <laughs> But, and I can't, frankly, be the only one who hasn't heard this fact spun as a clever way to talk about uh, why we should be able to recruit more single men, uh, which, frankly, is one of those micro uh, aggressions that, if you think about it, isn't really sending the right message. 
So there's some congruence with uh, what you see, what we see in the animal um, rights and animal protection movement with the broader nonprofit sector. Uh, at every level, from donors to staff, you see that there's, these are just some statistics that I plucked to illustrate that we've got a similar occurrence in our industry. Um, in the nonprofit industry, excuse me, as we do in the animal rights movement. And I did check at one leading animal protection organization that has volunteers numbering in the hundreds in a very structured program that 87% of their volunteers are women. But then you get to the CEO level and it flips. We saw 74% in the stats I showed you from our movement. And here we find across the sector close to 80% um, of the CEOs are male. So, so what? I mean, shoulder shrug, like, do we need to care about this? I mean, and I ask that as a real question, and far more studied and eloquent speakers could, should, and do expound on the evidence that female leadership matters. It matters to men, it matters to women, it matters to organizations, and it matters to outcomes. And it's, it's not just because it's unfair, right? Because there should be 50% of us uh, in leadership because there's 50% of us on the planet. Uh, it's, it's more than that. There's a deeper problem when we don't see women rising in our organization and our, in our organizations in the movement. And the first comes from something that I first noticed when I joined the movement, but I've subsequently read in numerous academic studies on, and that is that one of the chief reasons that women are so drawn to this movement in the first place is because of the similar experiences that so many women feel with regard to animals, abuse, objectification, and subordination. So it stands to reason that if our visions were brought to bear in our organizations, we would come at this from a different place than our male colleagues. And secondly, there is known correlation, a proven positive correlation between the presence of women in leadership and organizational performance. So we would expect as women rise in the leadership ranks that also the performance of organizations would increase. So let's agree to stipulate that it matters. Again, it matters to men, women, organizations, and animals. And my comments now are going to shift more to the ideas of things we can do better, and it will relate not just to issues related to equity and kind of advancement issues for women, but also recognizing that discrimination and harassment and sexualizing of our workplace has a lot to do with why we aren't rising. And I think that makes it important before we start to remember that there's an important distinction between intent and impact, and the pain and frustration that results when we don't acknowledge the adverse impact that results even from oblivious or a non-intention or in fact good intention that someone may have. And we need to all step back and recognize that privilege blinds us to the impact of our actions. I can never fully understand the ways that oppressive acts and language impacts others. All I can do is listen to them describe the impact and try to change my behavior. Because it also stands that if the conversation is focused on your intention, for example, I didn't mean to make you feel that way, then we marginalize the impact uh, that's had on the person who's experienced it. Because it frankly doesn't matter whether you think you're sexist uh, or whether you intended to be sexist if the experience for the person on the receiving end was that they were treated in a sexist manner. All right, so again, I, I want to note, these are from my personal experiences. Uh, for the most part, I'm a woman in the movement, so I'm giving myself standing. Um, I know you lawyers probably tell me that there's something trickier, but um, let's start with an easy one, shall we? Uh, enough with the bro, dude, man, and brother language in what are professional conversations. Um, for starters, it just ain't professional to talk like that. And I've seen a lot of serious men squirm and be visibly uncomfortable, frankly, just themselves being referred to as a dude. And your intent is totally just camaraderie and jocular. They're, you don't mean anything by it. But the impact is to marginalize us. And we don't talk like that. Women, when they use those kinds of language, we, if we do, it's not in a professional context. And we certainly don't use it across genders. I mean, I don't walk into a meeting with you and find it appropriate to say, hey, dude, uh, how's that report coming? Any more than it would be OK for you to turn to me and say, what's your thoughts on this, sister? It, and by the way, if you do that, you better hope I'm not weighing in on your next promotion. So enough of that. Here's a simpler one to understand, but harder. 
uh, in many ways. Uh, I like the homeland security kind of see something, say something approach. We treat these situations like the victims are the only ones with an obligation and a voice to say something. <laughs> Anyone else observing a woman uncomfortable, being made to feel uncomfortable in any setting can and should speak up. The bar is low. I mean, if a woman is uncomfortable, then it counts. It's something we ought to address, whether it triggers some legal... Carolyn, Carolyn will help us understand where the legal line is, but we should care about each other because it just simply is, makes someone uncomfortable. And so as a, if you're a donor or a volunteer or a colleague or a manager and you witness someone being made to feel uncomfortable, you should speak up. And you also need to really realize, colleagues in our movement, those of us that work together, that the workplaces, our organizations, are not the only place we are experiencing harassment. To do our jobs as external advocates, we're being harassed by reporters, by editors, by donors, by volunteers, by corporate representatives, by politicians, and yes, at conferences. Our organizations should be our refuge. They should protect us and they should have our backs. And if not, we run the risk of being less effective for animals individually and as organizations because we're going to squander time, energy, and resources, and we're losing women, really valuable women altogether. The animals need us too. If you are aware of it, you will start to notice that men are quoted in news media at a much higher rate than their female counterparts, and they appear on panels, bravo to this one, getting it right, Bravo to this whole conference, actually. I check all the time now about gender parity in conferences, but you will notice there is such a thing as hashtag all male panels. It'd be funny if it weren't sad. But we can do better, and men, there is something you can explicitly do to help. Don't take every press call, even if the reporter called you and wants to talk to you. When they call you, ask them if they're looking and striving for gender parity in their story, and if they're having trouble reaching it. And if they are, substitute yourself for a female colleague. And when asked, who else should I speak with, or who else should be on this panel, be the first to provide female contacts. And you get bonus points from me if you give that woman a heads up that you gave her contact information. And this includes, little asterisk, the big gets. I want you to refer me to the New York Times just as much as you are, would be inclined to refer me to the Bellevue Leader. I know the difference, and um, so does my future. So real leaders also know how to make space for others. Male allies walk into a conference room, notice that there's more people than seats around the table. How about you? Take a seat over there on the wall, and don't make a grand gesture and request, you know, lots of kudos for your chivalry, just do it. We're going to notice and we're going to appreciate it. Notice you're interrupting. If you aren't aware of your interrupting, ask for someone that you trust to pay attention to it for you and practice the art of stepping up and then stepping back. It's also a good idea to avoid taking personal vacations with your bosses or your employees. Making friends with our colleagues is supernatural and healthy. We spend a lot of time together in this movement, but Bro trips, especially with senior executives and leaders, provides access to women that women don't, don't get, to, get to participate in. You know, we just have heard about this nationally. I don't know if you heard that Vice President Pence revealed that he will not dine alone with a woman other than his wife. Well, unless he also won't dine alone with a man other than his wife, uh, then it's the women in his world who are missing out because they are losing a valuable opportunity to, um, to get to know a very important person in their world um, when they aren't invited. And I want to be very clear that I believe the vast majority of men are fully capable of being alone with women without cheating on their wives or harassing those women. And if a man can't handle that, then he's a liability and he shouldn't manage anyone or anything. So pay equity remains an issue in our movement as in other workplaces. So start by not asking prospective employees their salary history. This has been proven to exacerbate gender pay discrepancies and can sentence women to a lifetime of being underpaid. Ensure that HR is offering men and women the same things for the same jobs. And women, you ask for that, you ask for that verification as well. All right, newsflash, we all have egos, male and female, all of us. So men, in addition to giving your female colleagues the same type of props that you would give men on your team for a job well done, 
Also engage to seek corrections. These are examples of emails I've recently sent. I make it a point to reach out to reporters, conference organizers, and others with as much constructive feedback as I can about how we can do better going forward. Uh, and when a female colleague or an employee of yours expresses concerns about a situation where she feels that she's been marginalized, please don't respond to her by li listing off for her all the other times you got it right or telling her about that time you retweeted a suffragette. We don't care. We're talking about this instance, and we expect to be, um, you to uh, deal with that with us. The next three slides apply to men and women. Let's all get together and agree to banish hero worship, shall we? This pervades this movement. It's insidious. We give singular individuals credit for victories that teams are responsible for because it's almost never true that one person is solely responsible. I mean, we're called a movement. We are, by definition, building on the work of others and making progress as we go. So we need to reframe our kudos and seek to give organizations and teams credit, not single individuals. I'll add that hero worship also contributes to an environment that gives predators more of an, more of an opportunity and license, and we need to be really on the lookout for this. Amplify women's voices. The Obama White House senior females did this when they noticed something called heap heating. Anyone heard of heap heating? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, that's, an, that's when women raise an idea in a meeting. No one seems to hear it or, or react to it until a man makes the exact same point and suddenly it's like genius landed in the room. Um, amplifying, and anyone can do this in the meeting, male or female, is when a woman offers an idea, the next person who speaks should state her name to associate her with that idea before adding to it or reacting to it. All right, this last next one is kind of a big one. We need to have courageous conversations with each other about this topic. We all exhibit courage every day talking about animal suffering, so I know we have the necessary skills. What we need is the will to be brave, fearless, bold and unafraid to talk about impact and to find ways to prove, um, improve together, I think we need actual metrics that keep tabs on how that impact is changing as we develop um, mechanisms to improve it. Okay, quick story. Women, this is, I want to tell you something about strategic incompetence, something I've gotten really good at. You know this guy? His name is Wayne Pacelli. He runs the Humane Society of the United States. In 2008, when I was running the Prop 2 campaign, Wayne thought it would be a good idea for me and him to drive all over the state of California for over a week, stopping it at every editorial board, uh, every editorial board at the newspapers, and visiting major donors. That'd be great, except for I'm the campaign manager, and driving a car all over the state of California was not really what I wanted to be doing. So on day six, <clears throat> I ran out of gas. Later this day, I drove 100 miles in the wrong direction. Guess what I don't have to do anymore? <laughs> and People do. They expect women to make the airport runs, clean the dishes, make the name badges, uh, call the caterer. You know, we are often expected to do these things long after our job description fails to include them. So let's stop being so helpful. Um, we can do this strategically. I mean, if offering to take the notes in a meeting will get you into a meeting you wouldn't otherwise get into, and you'll get insights and contacts from that, then do that strategically. But we need to start not volunteering for things. We need to train subordinates and set an expectation that men and women both be competent at those tasks, and then if all else fails, you should suck at them. Saying you're sorry is an awesomely powerful thing to do when you've actually done something warranting an apology. Women, watch it with the sorries. It displays weakness and a lack of confidence, and it frankly devalues your real apologies when they're needed. Ask an ally to listen for these for you and tell you privately so that you can work on it. And speaking of confidence, this is a hugely devastating issue for women. It's largely a function of our upbringing and our biology, and there are some incredible resources to gain confidence, and that's the great news. It can be acquired. Now, you don't have to rely on natural confidence. This is something we can work on. And you have to be confident. I'm sorry, but I don't know an effective animal advocate who isn't confident. So you, you need this for your job as well. And still speaking of confidence, because it's that important, apply for the jobs you want, not for the one you've decided you're qualified for. 
It is well documented that women apply for promotions or jobs only when they meet 100% of the qualifications. Guess, guess the threshold for male applications, 50%. Men think, why wouldn't they want me? Men, women think, I don't know why they'd want me. I have to take a deep breath when I <laughs> talk about this one. You know that you could very well be, in most instances, the most qualified person who applied for that job? but you will never know if you disqualify yourself. So we need to put our hats in the ring because the worst thing that can happen from something like this is that you don't get a job that you are already not gonna apply for. So women, put, decide that you want a position. If you see a job and it's what you wanna do, write one hell of a cover letter, get ready to interview like nobody's business and go after that position. Excuse me a second. right. Ladies, we need to own our accomplishments. We need to get comfortable with that. I mean it, even if you think you don't need it. I have so many women friends in this movement. Oh, I don't care that I didn't get the credit for that. A, I don't know why you don't care. I'm not sure I believe you. But B, if other women don't see women in the news or on panels or getting awards or accepting compliments, then they don't see a path for themselves either. We're in advocacy, so advocate, please. Be visible take a press call, be on the panel, tweet, blog, write op-eds. Little tip I've learned from editors is that they, write, they have far fewer high quality writing submissions to op-eds from women. So you have a very, very high chance of having your op-ed published if, you can, um, if you're a good writer. So women take that to heed. But if you have a vision and a desire to lead, please don't be satisfied with a career spent implementing someone else's vision. Don't, don't live your life that way. We don't have to turn into men to do this. We can and should bring our genuine selves forward. It's just It's not about taking on male attributes. And you aren't in this alone. You might feel that way though. So you should form affinity groups, join them if you're invited, discuss strategies and support each other, band together when needed. Find a mentor. I've had so many amazing mentors, men and women, and I didn't find them by you know, formally asking them to be my mentor or applying for some mentorship program. Those were great, but I found them by identifying people who I wanted to be like, people I admired, and I just sort of found myself getting to be their mentee. You can do this authentically, and while you're at it, you can look for bosses who encourage you to make errors of commission, not omission. These are the bosses I have had They've given me freedom to experiment, to take risks, to make mistakes, to fail, and then to get better the next time. This last one relates to a pervasive conventional wisdom that women are our own worst enemies. We go it alone, we set ridiculous standards for other women, some of us bully, some of us use our own sexuality to get ahead. These are all anti-collaborative and they create additional obstacles for other women. Why are men better at collaborating? Well, in part, it's because they don't see advancement as a scarce resource. When men look around and see enough opportunities for all of them to advance. But women who are tough on one another are often reacting to their environment. Women who are in organizations that are dominated by men in the leadership ranks, consciously or not, see that there may only be room for one woman at the top. So they are vying with each other, whether they're aware of it or not. So in many ways, if we can implement some of the ideas here and start to foster more collaborative environments, this will be a culture that will let women um, put their guard down and work together with each other. And in the meantime, though, we women, we must consciously strive for this anyway. So I'm gonna bring this to a close, because I'm really excited to hear what Lauren and Carolyn have to say. But I wanna state something that's as important as it's ever been, and it's simpler, similar to something Joyce said at the top, and it's been made extra painful this week by our political leadership and the high-profile scandals. But there is no legitimate excuse for tolerating predatory male behavior, period. There is no legitimate excuse for tolerating it. You might think that the animal movement just can't live without a, a particular male actor, that some are too big to fail. I am submit to you that that is wrong. That is the wrong way of thinking. It's wrong functionally because 
organizations face a huge risk if they don't address harassment and discrimination head on. Our donor investments, the time and talent that all of our volunteers and staff have made over the years, those are all going to be squandered by some future PR crisis or a lawsuit. And on top of it, these are real people that we're talking about. These are women who bring as much drive and passion and intelligence and vision, and we are letting them go. We are not caring about them, at, at least as much about the animals that they are trying to help. We can do better. I think we should be a movement that treats women as the valuable and necessary leaders they are to change the future for animals. Our fates are tied to theirs. Thanks. So I'm Lorna Nellas, and I'm in the unique position of being both a woman and a woman of color in this movement, which has not, which I think really is why I'm seen mythically in this movement, Joyce, not because of the Whole Foods thing, but because I've been pretty outspoken my um, pretty much 30 years in this movement about all the issues and, and trouble I've seen. I do want to start really quick and thank Jennifer. Um, uh, actually where my organization is based and where I live is where a lot of the fires have been going on and I wasn't sure if I could make it here today um, because of the airport closures and I was pretty sure Jennifer was going to put out the fire herself so that I could be here today but I was glad that Joyce instead suggested I fly through San Francisco um, so the issues that we're talking about today are not new these are issues as Joyce knows have been going on um, seriously since I've been involved in this movement, um, since the late 1980s. And not only about the fact that this movement is made up of a majority of women, but the fact that we have what Carol Adams encourages us to use the term sexual exploiters, because we don't want to imply that predators tend to be certain animals or anything bad. So sexual exploiters run rampant in this movement, and we allow it to happen. Women in this movement, unfortunately, what I have noticed have sometimes been complicit in everything that's taking place, mostly women who are in a partnership with these men in this movement. Um, they are leaders of organizations, or they're the partners of men in these organizations that are complicit in what's taking place. Um, as Joyce mentioned, um, the victory that my, that my organization achieved with Whole Foods Market in sparking the CEO to go vegan, most people don't know that. What some people hear in large organizations is that their founder, the male white man who founded their organization is the one that did that. A large publication in this movement ran a story about the fact that John Mackey had gone vegan, yet refused to mention that this was done by anybody. I don't even care when I contacted the editor if it was me that they recognized. But to not recognize that our movement had that type of power that the plight of the animal so much encouraged him um, to make changes in his own life and his own corporation wasn't worthy of publication, dismissed our power. And I have no choice but to accept because I was how I'd been treated by this man who was disgusting, um, because I was a woman and a woman of color. But if I had been a man, everybody would, be knowing, would know that I was the one behind that. Many people in this room might be familiar with legislation that we passed in the state of California to ban the sale and production of foie gras. I was one of three women who passed this law in the state of California. Not many people know it was three women who got this done. My organization was the one that sued Adidas for violating the California law. We won at the California Supreme Court thanks to a woman attorney. These are things that people don't hear about as much because it's about women in this movement. I've been sexually assaulted in this movement, and I've been sexually assaulted when I was a teenager um, working fast food um, as I was a vegan, but it was the only place I could work to put food on the table of my family. And there are things that we as women go through, and we don't really know what to do it at the time when it happens to us, and that's why panels like this are important. This may have been going on for a long time, but what's happening is still taking place right now, and it's imperative for us to pay attention to it. And when that happens to us, 
we need to start recognizing that we need to say something. If we don't feel comfortable saying something to somebody, to the person who did it to us, we talk to somebody else about it because those men need to be held accountable and things have to change. Jennifer outlined a good amount of that. Um, but I have to tell you that to me, what hurts me the most when I hear these issues being discussed, because there are a lot of men in this movement who are in positions of authority who are known for sexually assaulting women, young women, and it breaks my heart to think about all the young women who that could happen to next. And we can't not let that continue. This often gets dismissed as gossip. I don't gossip. I don't want to gossip. It's not gossip. This is protection. We owe it to other women in this movement to tell them what's happening. There's a lot of men who've been tried, who they've been in attempts to hold them accountable, and lawsuits are thrown at these women to shut them up. Hopefully there are some people in this room who will help those women fight these lawsuits when they try to speak out and protect themselves. Another thing, and I'm going to, I have to like, I got to move fast and I know, but I have to talk about women's stuff and then I have to talk about me as a POC as well. And that's a person of color. But that a lot of men, what they don't realize, especially white men, is that you are an assumed to be an expert. Just because you're a white man, you are assumed to be an expert even though you have not earned anything to have that place. So please don't think when you are looked to as an expert that you've done anything to deserve that. There's a good chance you have not. Try to make, I feel very strongly that men do things as they state everything is fact. We need to focus on hens. We need to focus on, we need to do this without stating it's their opinion. I don't know, me as a woman, I try to always say this is my opinion. This is how I think it should be done. So when you hear that, remind yourself, they're giving their opinion, but they're just not identifying it that it's their opinion. If you notice a woman being talked over, this happens on conference calls. I mean, if you're ever a woman on a conference call, you're like, oh, I said I was here, but all the men are chit-chatting with each other. You know, men can speak up too, but, you know, identify that women are trying to speak on the line and are being talked over. Jennifer talked about uh, men taking credit for women's work, which happens time and time again. Do not dismiss the experience of others um, just because they haven't been yours. Um, let's see. Jennifer talked about being aware of the ratio to men to women, but I encourage you to also look at the ratio of people of color um, who are on panels as well. And to me, I don't mean that in tokenism. There are so many people in this movement who are now in this bandwagon of just putting a person of color on a panel just because they have that ratio, and that person has no basis for being on that panel. But I guarantee you there probably is another person of color who could be on that panel. But don't just throw a person of color on a panel just because you want to have your, you know, ratio a certain way. If you run a vegan organization, you should have a zero tolerance for um, sexual harassment against women. And to say this, I say this, I'm going to switch to my POC stuff, but there are you know, definitely some men in this movement. I happen to be married to one of them, Mark Hawthorne. He's an animal rights author who basically works his day job to help me live my dream of doing food empowerment project. There's people like Kim Stallwood and other men who often amplify the voices of women and women of color to make sure we're not ignored. Now, what it's like to be a person of color in this movement, and I see a few of us out here, is not easy. It's not easy at all. Um, you know, how do I even start this, right? Um, we are seen as interchangeable. If you, if, I am good friends with um, Dr. Breeze Harper and AFCO, who are amazing thinkers and philosophers in this movement who have yet to be recognized as philosophers in this movement. Um, and we, we talk about how the fact that people seem to think we're interchangeable. I'm a food justice activist. That's what I do. They philosophize. I can't go up and talk on any panel that's about philosophizing. I'm an activist. Just like AF will not go and talk on a panel about food justice. That's not what she does. We may be people of color, but just like you wouldn't have somebody speak on a puppy mill panel who does veganism, you're not going to do that with us either. We're not interchangeable. We may be people of color. We're not just interchangeable. We have to constantly deal. This movement already has to deal with sexist campaigns, sexist, sexist campaigns in this movement. We also have to deal with not only sexist campaigns, but racist campaigns by this movement. 
which, which reveal historical trauma by people in this movement. Th th this movement thinks nothing about slavery analogy. Somehow we think it's okay when those of us, I don't know about you, but when I found out the dreaded comparison was written by a white woman, I was horrified. We have organizations in this movement working with Sheriff Joe Arpaio, who is a known convicted racist sheriff in Arizona. Yet this movement brings him out and parades him like he's our best friend. Well, you know what? He's not the best friend of my people. In fact, he is the reason why so many people in Arizona who are Latinx have been murdered. He's not my friend. And to have this movement bring him as somebody who thinks like us or works like this is offensive. Now, my organization, we're a vegan food justice group, but we also talk about the rights of farm workers who pick our food. We don't just talk about slaughterhouse workers, which is very easy for vegans to talk about. We talk about the farm workers who pick our produce that not everybody wants to think about, those who feed us every day. We talk about the lack of access to healthy foods in communities of color and low-income communities because people in this movement see fit to say things like, it's easy to be vegan. Well, it sure is if you have a car and you make a living wage and depending on where you live. But it is not easy for everybody to be vegan. Not in the communities we work in, and it definitely was not for me growing up. These are the things that we do that show our ignorance and our privilege, that we don't think past ourselves to think what it's like for other people. We sound ignorant. We are discredited when somebody says in a, in a room full of people, it's easy to be vegan, and there are Five people in that room who think, really? Well, my aunt can't, my uncle can't, my cousin can't. Maybe everything this person's saying isn't true because I know it's not easy to be vegan. It's not that easy for people to be vegan. And what happens is, is that when organizations like mine do this type of vegan outreach, we don't get the funding because our vegan outreach looks different, right? It doesn't look like what the white mainstream movements are doing. But you know what? I'm a woman of color, and I run this organization. My, my board is all women. My staff is all women of color. That is how our organization runs. It is about the mission and the ethics of who we are. People of color in this movement, we do not want to be tokenized. And I, I can't speak for everybody, but I'll tell you the ones that I know, we do not want to be tokenized. We, are, you know, we have racist campaigns from the live markets to the Korean dog efforts. We really want to talk about people eating Korean dogs when we're killing how many billions of chickens in this country? We're killing cows in this, this country, but we want to talk about Korean dogs? We have a mess to clean up over here before we start pointing the finger at other countries and what other people do. As a Mexican, I am a very proud Mexican, but I constantly have to hear what those people do to animals. Those people don't care about animals. To think that we have to hear this from our own movement, much less from the alleged highest office in this country, what we have to hear about our people. Then we have the cruelty investigations of factory farms and slaughterhouses, where un almost always it's people of color who are the ones who are getting convicted. And nobody wants to talk about why ICE raids happen a lot after these investigations take place. We need to be more careful about how we do our advocacy. We need to be more careful about what we mean in terms of protecting those who are the most vulnerable. There's somebody who is on the, one of my Washington chapter, um, we have a chapter in Seattle, and he worked for a large animal organization. He's from Colombia. He's vegan. And he was working building dog houses, and it was 30 degrees outside when he was working with this organization. And he came inside to get gloves, and the person who worked at this organization would not give him gloves until he said the word properly because he speaks with an accent because he's from Colombia. This is what's happening in this movement, this so compassionate movement that we have. This is what's taking place. Again, historical trauma, the slavery analogy. I mean, if y'all want tips on what to do, why do, why use the, the legitimate suffering and pain of non-human animals by bringing up things like that? It doesn't make sense. If it offends one person, you don't do it. 
What the animals go through is enough. And it can be the slavery analogy. It could be the Holocaust. I'm not Jewish. I'm not going to use it. If Jewish people want to use it, that's their decision. But for other people to use it, I think you need to think twice about that. I really do. It's not your, it's not what pains you. That's not your history and your family history that went through that. Saying things like all lives matter, not helpful. It dismisses the Black Lives Matter movement. Black Lives Matter movement that is very important, needs to be respected, needs to be supported. It dismisses that. It's basically saying, oh, no, 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 I, all lives matter. Well, the Black Lives Matter movement was started because innocent, well, and it doesn't even matter if they're innocent or not. Black people are being killed in the streets of this country. People want to think that we're all animals. We're talking about people in this country who are still being termed and having racist tactics being spoken to them about being animals. Black athletes having banana peels thrown at them. These are not okay things to do if we truly want to be a compassionate movement. We are hurting the animals. We are hurting our potential allies. And, we're all, and more importantly to me, these issues to me are connected. There's no separation here. I can't talk about veganism without talking about farm worker justice. I can't encourage people to eat more fruits and vegetables when suffering's happening in the fields. What I encourage um, young attorneys, especially young attorneys of color, as I've spoken to some of them, is do not be the attorney that takes all the dog bite cases. Do not be the attorney that takes all the cases that are related to people of color. You have every right to speak at Harvard and Yale representing your organization as anybody else does. And in fact, I would say more importantly, so that other young attorneys of color see you there and can want to be like you. Because you don't see our, there's so many people have said, it's so good to see somebody who looks like me up there speaking because you don't see us that much. When I did Viva and I was doing these investigations of factory farms and slaughterhouses, I was speaking. When I started talking about racism and injustice taking place and how connected these issues are, it was better off to leave me in the back. The good old boys of this movement didn't want me around anymore. The good old boys of this movement who for organizations like mine and Joyce to not forget founded the Animal Legal Defense Fund as a woman Running an organization in this movement is difficult to get funding because of the good old boy system, because they can go and have beers and do what else later. It's hard for us to get funding for the work that we do. We also have the fact that men are more apt to support each other. And again, maybe it's what Jennifer was saying about because there's not any less fields for them to succeed as there seem to be for us as women. But I have to ask people not to be silent about this stuff. And that means on social media, I've known a lot of good vegans who've spoken up against racist tactics on um, social media and they get banned from them. But all I can do is thank you for doing that. Somebody has to. Um, there's also the problem we have of theft of knowledge in this movement. Food Empowerment Project, we talk about the fact that, that chocolate isn't cruelty free if it comes from the, the slavery of children in Western Africa right now. Other organizations have started to say, yes, we know things aren't cruelty free. They don't credit Food Empowerment Project. They take our work. AFCO's work has been stolen. A lot of, and people of color are doing this to us too. I just gave a talk at the Veg Fest a little while ago and I credit, by all means, Susie Costin um, from Farm Sanctuaries for some brilliant insight that she had about farmed animals. We owe it to those who bring us the knowledge to give them credit everywhere that we can, and we need to do that. I have seven minutes, so I'm going to rant about one more thing. I apologize. Pay. If you run an organization, pay is a big thing for everybody. This movement is so white because we, can't, we aren't paying people well. It's only the very privileged who can afford to work in this movement, right? I still give my mom money. I grew up without a lot of money. The idea that I, even though I did it for a while, and I still do, okay, anyway, it will ignore me as part of this equation. Most of us cannot live with no money, 
right? But if you have mom and dad or a trust fund, you can probably make nothing for the animal organization that you work for. If you're a person of color, it's a lot harder. We have college debt. We probably have family members that we're still financially supporting. We need to raise those wages. We need to give people benefits. We can't continue to say, oh, it's for the animals. People should be willing to do this work and be getting paid nothing. That's an injustice and an insult to those of us who want to dedicate our lives to this cause. We also need to stop with the abusive bosses in this movement, this horrible, there are so many people in this movement who treat other people badly. They're not always, they're not always, well, they can be the leader of the organization, but they also can be in employees within organizations. And we need to cut them loose. We need to start firing these toxic people who treat other employees, and almost always women who are treated badly. Almost always women of color who are treated badly. Once you start noticing this in your organization, you work there or you don't, take the management to task. Because this is how we lose so many people in this movement, because people think it's okay to treat people badly, and yet we call ourselves a movement of compassion. There are some cruel, vicious people in organizations right now who treat people, seek to demean women to make people feel like they have no self-worth and it takes years to get them back up again. Please, when you see this happen, if you're a man in one of these organizations and you see it happen to the five women who work there, speak up. Because for some reason, this is what Jennifer and I talked about, some reason, 10 women equal one man's opinion. You can't, you know, if you want an opinion on something, you have to ask 10 women to, how am I explaining this better? Our voices are not enough, basically. One man can say something and everybody thinks it's true, but we have to ask 10 women before we believe them. We can't do that anymore. This movement, we need to stop having to talk about this. We need to just get on with the work. We need to not have to, we need to, not have to count women and people of color in everything that we do. Don't marginalize us more than we already are. It's important for women, and I encourage you, if you are a donor for an organization, please go to the board, look at the board makeup, look up the staff makeup, and make sure that the people of color and the women are not all in admin positions. Because that's where a lot of us tend to be put. Jennifer and I are like, Screw that, I'll start my own group. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. That's how we are, and granted, not everybody's like that. And so je women like Jennifer and I, it's our responsibility to speak out for those who are not as obnoxious as we are. Sorry, Jennifer. Um, so that's our role. Um, so I thank you for letting me rant and rave, and I'm sure you probably know I could speak even more about this, but all I can do is thank um, Joyce for making sure that this panel stayed a part of this conference because we need to keep talking about it. We need to have these voices heard until things change. We can't say this is an old issue. This is still an issue and until it gets fixed, we have to deal with it. Thanks. They've got me fired up. Hi, everyone. See that question, um, who am I and why am I here? I am Carolyn Walker. Um, I'm here because I care about animals and animal rights and protection, although I wouldn't exactly consider myself an animal rights activist. Um, I do enjoy a certain level of recognition within certain legal and professional circles. Um, but not so much within the animal protection movement. So I thought about it. Uh, why did the organizers of this event ask me to be here? And the simple answer is that the title of this program is Gender and Race Redux. And since I spoke on this topic at this um, event last year, I'm the redux part of this program. <laughs> but I actually do know a little bit about the topic of race and gender. I'm a 26-plus year attorney, and I'm a partner at Stolbury's in Portland, and my practice is management side employment law, and I've got a specialty in education law. 
And in parallel with this practice, I've focused on issues of workplace diversity, inclusion, and retention. And that's where my focus will be during this program today, on dealing with issues of gender and race within the workplace. Um, but before I get into the substance of my presentation, I'd uh, like to ask you to ask yourselves, not so much who you are, I'm um, sure you already know that, but why you are here. And the answer to that could be that I'm an attorney and I need the CLE credits, so get on with it, Carolyn. And if that's the case, that's fine. Um, but if you ask yourself that question and your answer is, because I really do care about these issues of race and gender and I want to shift the paradigm within the animal protection movement, then I'm glad to hear that answer. And I, I urge you to consider this. Um, I don't impose it on you. But please be thinking about, first, what you can do to um, do no harm. Because as my co-panelists have mentioned, there are a lot of well-intentioned people that um, do a lot of harm, even though they don't, in, they don't intend to do that. But secondly, what you can really do to be a part and actually make a change within the movement with, with respect to race and gender issues. So let me get right down to it. Black livelihoods matter. As I mentioned, I'm an employment lawyer, and so I come at you from that perspective. And I use a provocative heading on this slide, Black Livelihoods Matter, to introduce the concept of pay equity, which we've already talked about a little bit, inclusion and retention within the employment context. And here, with the hashtag Black Livelihoods Matter, I do think that um, substituting or including names of other groups that have been historically marginalized within the workplace, such as women and Latinos and minorities, it would be appropriate to say Latino livelihoods matter or women's livelihoods matter. Here it would be appropriate because we know that these groups have been marginalized as well and they, in their, in their ability to earn, significantly less than their white male counterparts. So, um, I did speak on these issues, as I mentioned last year, and unfortunately, I don't feel that there's really that much good news to share in terms of positive change. I included in my online materials, for example, an article, I don't know if you've had a chance to review it, um, from, from Bloomberg Law from about two months ago that talked about the fact that women on boards of directors in both the public and private sector, the progress for them being added to those boards has halted. And this is despite the fact that abundant, an abundance of research has shown that having women in, in, on these boards of directors and having diversity on these, boards of, uh, on these boards really does help to increase the financial well-being of an organization. My observation is that issues of misogyny and sexism, bigotry, and outright hatred are just as prevalent, if not more prevalent, than they were at this time last year. I wonder why. <laughs> In fact, last year, this time, I was actually pretty hopeful. Um, it was uh, this weekend, 2016, and I was speaking at this conference. We were in New York, so I had tickets to Hamilton, and which was great, and I um, was going to watch the debate that evening, the, the presidential debate. I believe it was the third one, and I was just convinced that Hillary Clinton was going to trounce Donald, Donald Trump in the debate and win the election. And the reason I was convinced of that is that I was certain, I was confident that this country, my country, would give a sharp and swift lesson to someone who was so openly sexist, bigoted, and so unapologetically misogynistic. And I really did have something to say about it. Let's watch and listen. There are unbelievably some who still think that they can do whatever they want to women because they're a star and women will let you do, right? Well, guess what, Mr. Trump, you can't. <laughs> But then I had to ask myself, did this country, by putting him in office, actually say, yes, you can? 
Yes, you can do this. And it's the message to other men in the workforce that you can be president, CEO, executive director, manager, and still get to keep your J-O-B, and that in fact, you can get elected or appointed or promoted to an even higher position? Is that the message? That's what I had to ask myself. And when I hear stories of how prevalent sexism is within the animal rights movement, I'm shocked, and I really shouldn't be, because the fact is, it's familiar, okay? It's something that we hear about all the time. And I wonder, is the message to women that if you speak up for yourself, if you actually say something about these things that have happened to you, does that mean you're going to be attacked, re-victimized, and uh, shunned by your male and female colleagues, and it'll be harder for you to get a job or keep your job because you spoke up for yourself. This, isn't, this is not moral, and it certainly can rise to the level of not being legal. So that was last year, right, that I was convinced that things could have been different. Um, and now this year, Harvey, really? I, I'm just, it's, it continues. But moving on, I want to talk about this um, race and gender in the context of employment law. And when, when I talk about that, the issue is generally on um, issues of discrimination and harassment. And rather than give a primer on the different areas of protection under um, the laws on harassment and discrimination, let me just say, to sum it up, that discrimination is when a person is treated differently or less favorably, and harassment is when a person is treated in a way that uh, rises in an inappropriate way that rises to the level of affecting negatively that person's employment because the behavior is so severe and pervasive. And it becomes illegal when it happens based on that person's protected characteristics or their protected classification. And actually, if you do want to primer on this, I did speak a lot more in depth about this last year, and that video is still online, so I encourage you to take a look at it if, you're, if you care to. But there's also a theory of retaliation, and what often happens in the legal context is uh, claimants, plaintiffs, employees bring retaliation claims because they may have had an underlying bias complaint against an employer or a coworker, and then they feel that they are treated all the worse for having complained about it. And so rarely now, as, a, as an employment law litigator, do I, see, do I come across a case of harassment and discrimination where we don't also see a parallel claim of retaliation. And sometimes the claim of retaliation has a better chance of success even when the underlying bias claim doesn't hold water. So these issues are covered by Title VII of the Civil Rights Act and by uh, equivalent state and local laws. I mentioned that the problems with harassment and discrimination arise when the victim is part of a protected classification. So who is protected? The answer is everyone. Everyone is protected if you belong to a certain race, if you are of a gender, if you, are, uh, you have national origin, if you are a certain age, everyone is protected. So there are broad categories of protection, but obviously we're focused on race and gender for these purposes. Regarding race and gender equity, in the context of employment law, every employment decision matters. That's from the beginning, from the recruitment, from the hiring and interview process, from uh, the, the promotions that may be given, from termination decisions, and also decisions on compensation. So the, the last major law that I want to focus on is the Equal Pay Act, because that is re with respect to compensation. And the Equal Pay Act was uh, signed into law in June of 1963 by President Kennedy. And so it's 54 years old, and it was aimed at ending the disparity between uh, genders with respect to wages. And even though that um, act was enacted 54 years ago, the fact is that women are still earning 80 cents on the dollar to white males, compared to white males, and black women are earning 63 cents on the dollar. Hispanic women are earning 54 cents on the dollar. And these numbers actually reflect an increase from last year for 
white women, a decrease for black women, and for Hispanic women, it stayed steady. And the, those numbers, that difference gets even worse at higher paying jobs. Discriminatory and harassing behavior and pay disparities can obviously have a serious effect on, on the workplace. And um, you can see from the slide what the consequences are for an employer in terms of the legal consequences. And I understand that um, from others in the animal rights movement and from what I'm hearing in this panel today, that there is a prevalence of men within the movement who abuse and harass women and that there are women in the movement who are complicit because they have benefited. And these, enabl these enablers apparently argue that they keep putting these uh, abusive people in place because if these abusers leave, they'll take donors and dollars with them. And these enablers also manipulate women to keep them silent because they say, well, yes, he's done bad things, but he's good for the animals. I have a couple of responses to this. Um, first, I want to acknowledge absolutely that the fear of speaking up is real. I don't want to sugarcoat that. But I will also say that the dangers and the consequences of not speaking up are pretty severe. These include perpetuation of the behavior by the, uh, by the person who's engaging in the bad acts, guilt of the victim for not speaking up, uh, signal to the perpetrator that the behavior is okay. And it also results in additional victims, right? We, we know that. It's like an infestation. If you know of one, there's a whole lot more out there. So don't assume that because you've heard a complaint about, you know, one person compl uh, complaining about someone, uh, a man abusing them or harassing them, that that's all there is out there. Don't assume that there is more, but don't assume that this, this is the only one. Get rid of your assumptions and find out what the facts are. And so speaking of additional victims, how in the world, how in the world did Harvey Weinstein get away with this for decades? Decades before the New York Times story broke on his serial harassment and his alleged rapes. Um, I think that the reason is because some people were silenced by settlements, but not all. Some of them were silenced by fear. And I think we're actually at an interesting inflection point at this country because on the one hand, we hear that since the, um, the tape, the Trump tape broke a year ago, Women on Wall Street have reported there's more locker room talk that they're subjected to. But on, in other examples like that, but on the other hand, we are hearing more and more women speaking up and more and more powerful men that are being brought down by their heinous behavior. And so I think that what we hear, what we hear and what we're seeing is that there is actually an opportunity and something to be hopeful in. Uh, for in all of this, people are speaking out and they're saying no more. So for those enablers who try to silence victims by uh, saying within your movement that a person who engages in this sort of heinous sexual harassment and uh, behavior should not be outed because he's good for the animals, I say shame on your complicit ass. <laughs> shame on you. And instead, instead of shaming the victim, let's shift this paradigm and start shaming those who are engaging in the behavior, shame the perpetrator, shame his accomplices. Let them be afraid for change. And something else that should strike fear in the heart of these accomplices is a little legal cause of action known as aiding and abetting. Now, Title VII that I mentioned to you before does not have a provision for aiding and abetting, but some states' laws, including Oregon, Oregon has an aiding and abetting statute within the employment laws that can make it uh, illegal for individual employee defendants to act in a way that, uh, that, that is in, in, um, 
that is not in compliance with the employment laws. So an individual defendant can be liable for aiding and abetting an employer in their, their harassment or the discrimination against women and against people of color. And I'm a defense lawyer, so I see this aiding and abetting cause of action misused all the time by plaintiff's, employee, uh, plaintiff's employment lawyers when they bring the cause of action against managers and supervisors who are just doing their jobs. But I can tell you that it's not in anyone's job description to engage in sexual harassment. And so that is an area, the cases that we're seeing now, like those against Fox News and Harvey Weinstein, that's an area where aiding and abetting that cause of action would be put to good use. And ignoring this kind of behavior or not taking it seriously enough, it can have serious consequences on the employers. An example of this is a case from an article that I included in my online materials. And um, it's an Idaho case, it's Fuller versus Idaho Department of Correction. And what happened there is that the court refused to dismiss a case after de determining that a jury could infer that the employer had um, engaged in gender-based discrimination based on evidence that a manager treated the person who was accused of having raped the female, female employee, treated that person more solicitously than he treated the woman who had accused the, accu the uh, person of raping her. The employer got in trouble for that. So an employer who is lackadaisical about this kind of reported conduct, conduct or who doesn't take it seriously enough, they act at their own peril. I've used examples here of gender-based harassment, but we could apply these same sort of arguments to race-based harassment and also to discrimination cases. There are some legal consequences, obviously, I've talked about that, but there are others that are just as damaging and on the aggregate could be more expensive um, and in, in, both in terms of dollars and, and in terms of time to employers if we were to quantify those other consequences. And these include, obviously, decreased morale, which can lead to increased absenteeism, an unwillingness of employees to participate in development efforts, um, attendance issues, and the list goes on. It can also limit the job pool and the recruitment efforts on behalf of an organization. So think about that. Even in situ situations where certain behavior that goes on within your organization doesn't rise to the level of legal uh, harassment or discrimination, can have a chilling effect on people whose employment you might want to try to retain or that you might want to attract. So I've included in my materials an example of a case that did not, at least in the, court ex, uh, the court's estimation, that did not rise to the level of being illegal under Title VII, and it's the EEOC versus Catastrophe Management Solutions. It's the 11th Circuit case that was decided just over a year ago. And this involved a black woman whose employment offer was rescinded after she refused to cut off her locks. Now, the reason the court gave for this is they said that Title VII doesn't cover mutable characteristics such as hairstyle, including locks. It only covers immutable characteristics such as race, gender, et cetera, those protected classifications that I mentioned to you earlier. So now, whether you think that that case was wrongly or rightly decided, what message do you think that that sends to people of color? It sends the message, in my estimation, that that organization or that company doesn't care about that person's cultural or um, their, their cultural sensitivity. It, is a, it indicates a lack of cultural appreciation. Okay? So now I've talked to you about these issues that I think are pretty obvious issues, but what about the ones that are less blatant and arguably more insidious? Here I'm talking about the kind of behavior that, at least from the standpoint of the affected employees, leads to death by a thousand cuts. And by that, I'm talking about micro inequities, pay disparities, um, attacks on political correctness as allegedly impeding the uh, free speech of individuals, assumptions, implicit bias, microaggressions, et cetera. And I think the best way that an organization can start to address these issues is by increasing awareness 
of, of these sorts of behaviors to begin with. And the fact is, unfortunately, that the law has not yet caught up to the evolving conventional wisdom that these kinds of behaviors can have serious and lasting consequences and effects in the workplace. And another approach that a company or an organization can take in tandem with increasing awareness is to actually increase the diversity in top leadership positions. And when preparing for this, I came across a really excellent article that I did not include in your materials because they wanted to charge me too much for the copyright. Um, but it suggests that based on recent research, complaints of bias by employees decreases when the top management, when the leaders of the company or the organization are diverse. And whether that's perception or reality, it seems to make a difference to those in the, in the workplace employees, how they feel about their experience in the workplace. So hire and develop more women and people of color in top leadership positions, getting back to what my co-panelists talked about. And there are people out there who really do have the skills to do it and may just not have been given the opportunity. And don't stop there, to Lauren's point, because that's just tokenism. Don't stop with one or two. You don't need to do that. And you know what the fabulous uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg said when she's asked when she'll be satisfied that there are enough women on the Supreme Court? You know it with, you'd say it with me, when there are nine, yeah. So um, in my speech last year, I gave specific examples of what you can do and how to combat, combat these issues in the workplace. Some of my co-panelists today have done that as well, and I invite you to view the last year's video for more specifics. But I didn't in last year's presentation talk about how to address pay disparities. And some of that, I believe, um, Lauren has already covered, so I won't go over that. But I will say that there are some other things that you can do. And this is really important because remember that pay disparities, it, um, these can have such a significant effect, a generational impact on women and people of color because women over the course of a career will earn about, white women will earn about half a million dollars less and black women will earn about one million dollars less over the course of a career than their white male counterparts. So first, empower yourself and know your worth. Right? Know what is being paid by others in, the, in your industry so you come into the negotiation from a place of power. And it's important to address this early because it's hard to catch up if you start low because most pay raises are given only annually and incrementally. And negotiate like you should, okay? And I know that there will be some people who will tell you negotiate like a man. And I don't want to say that to you because I don't think maleness is the standard that we should all strive to achieve. Um, I want to tell you to negotiate like a person who knows her worth and knows what others are getting paid. And talk to each other. It may feel taboo to talk about um, what you're getting paid, to talk about your wages in the workplace, but you really should. It isn't illegal, and in fact, um, the National Labor Relations Act actually gives you, guarantees you the right to talk about your salary. So it is illegal for an employer to tell you not to discuss your salaries. And um, ask for a raise, bottom line. These are just a few suggestions, and I'm sure that if you do some research online, you'll find many more to help ensure that you and your colleagues are paid fairly. And I just want to be clear and reiterate the point that my co-panelists have made, that I'm talking to everyone here. This is not just a woman's issue. It's not just an issue for people of color. It is a societal issue. Whenever there are disparities in pay or in treatment in any way based on a person's gender or race, it is a societal issue. And so you don't have to sit back and not take action. Just don't try to take over. But, and this is how we can, how we can take action to sort of stop this bleeding from the death by a thousand cuts. And with that, I'll sum it up because I'm way out of time. Um, people need to understand that there's a price that all the society pays when there are any inequities. And I think that our late, great national treasurer, Dr. Maya Angelou, summed it up best when she said that equal rights, fair play, justice are all like the air. We all have it or none of us has it, and that's the truth of it. Thank you. I want to thank each of our panelists. I, I, 
and, and I was unduly given credit. Really, it's the planning committee for the Animal Law Conference that felt it was important enough to bring this back again, and I hope we'll continue to discuss this. It's not directly you know, focused on the animals, and yet we really need to discuss this. Um, we have a few minutes for questions, so those who'd like to ask questions, please go to the mics, because otherwise we can't hear you. And I saw Jennifer and Lauren making notes, so if you don't have questions, they do. Um, <laughs> And I'd like to, to just correct a, a misstatement I made at the, at the beginning of the talk. I assumed it was Harvey Weinstein's mother who should teach him how to treat women, but it probably was his father. So. <laughs> so. And, oh, there you are, hi. Hi, um, as somebody who worked in uh, animal rescues for 10 years, this spoke to me in so many ways, um, but my, my question is, is, so you recognize in the animal movement that there are a lot of people who get involved with animals because they can't stand people. I hear that all the time. They don't want to work with people, so they work with animals instead. And then there's a lot of people like down at the bottom who don't value themselves more than they value the animals. So they end up getting in this cycle of devaluing themselves um, in order to keep doing what they're doing because, I mean, retaliation and not and a limited job availability where if you do risk your job, you're not going to be um, with this dog you care about anymore or, or you know, doing this job that you think is so important. Um, so how do we work on that? How do we, how do we educate people on that animal law is also about people and not just about your uh, animals? Anybody? Anybody? Animal law is about oh. people. Are these on? Oh, yeah. Actually, Jennifer, move that closer. OK. Thank you. From a, from a legal perspective or from an employment law perspective? Either way. I mean. OK. <laughs> I, I would say, um, does your organization have an HR department or HR function? Uh, the organization I particularly think of, their HR person was also their COO and wasn't formally trained. OK. And it was a very crazy organization. All right. Well, in a, in a situation like that, I would, I would say that um, the person who is suffering from the, you know, mistreatment still needs to speak up. And I am a defense lawyer, so I am hesitant to say <laughs> contact a plaintiff's attorney. But what I will say is, um, if that person doesn't feel that I'll they're getting satisfaction, <laughs> if that person feels they don't uh, feels that they're not getting satisfaction from whomever they reported the situation to within their organization, go to the local um, equivalent of the EEOC. And here in Oregon, it's the Bureau of Labor and Industries, and those state agencies can provide guidance and help, and can also suggest that maybe that person wants to see an attorney. But I would say the first step to take is, is to be courageous and actually speak up for themselves. Yeah. I, I would add that we need to remember we're not a startup movement anymore. And the people who are heading organizations or, or who are in upper management really need to, to have HR people on staff or at least available. We need to act more professionally. And, 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 and assure that our employees and our, and our volunteers are, are, are treated with equanimity. Can I just add also that um, there's a role for all of us who see that woman for what she's suffering and what she's going through. And sometimes just telling her that you see her experiences and that you're there for her, even if she doesn't avail herself of your kindness, just being seen and being and, and letting someone know that you're aware of them and you're, you're, you give them the value that you're saying they're taking away from themselves. And I, I do think we need to find ways to work together, um, whether it's informally or creating task force of employees. I mean, I'm not going to say it's time to unionize animal protection organizations, but it might be time. <laughs> Can I just add, I just want to add something as well. I've worked for a couple of really horrible organizations, and there's a legacy of former employees of these organizations who were like support groups. You know, I can talk to people who work there now, even though I haven't worked there for 10 years, and they're going through what I went through. 
and um, it doesn't change, and they're toxic organizations. And I think one of the hardest things and the most heartbreaking thing is the fear of retaliation. And I'm not even talking, I'm talking about just simply being treated badly. Like there's this known thing that you really shouldn't talk bad publicly about us because we already have the opposition who doesn't like us. So if this gets out of how bad we are, it could really damage the animals, it can really hurt the movement. And so what ends up happening is that a lot of times these people leave and they don't get involved anymore because they're scared and they're scarred and they need therapy, frankly, for the cruel treatment that they've endured. Um, and I don't know what this person's going through, but if it's anything like that, then I encourage them to be honest with their open network and tell their network that it's okay to tell other people about it because what's happening is that with some of these organizations that's been going on for so long, it's starting to become known, even though it's not front page of any mainstream newspaper, the more people in the movement know, the better that we are. And I will be a, that person can contact me, I will give you my card because that's the most important thing is for us to know that we have each other and that a lot of us have gone through this and they're not alone. Yeah, you know, can I add something else to that? Something else that I didn't think about. Um, with organizations, you're going to have a board of directors. If you're not getting satisfaction from the leadership and you don't have an HR uh, per a person playing in the HR function, go to the board. Oh, this is when I think you're so cute because so many animal groups boards are made up of their best friends oh, and it's not going to do anything at all. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, I am cute, but go ahead and go in, in that situation, go to the state agency and go to the plaintiff's attorneys. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one more question and uh, I will ask the questioner to speak slowly because <laughs> we know me. you. Hi, Joyce. Uh, no, thank you all for such a uh, thoughtful and relevant panel. Uh, just for the folks in the room who may not be aware, uh, this summer uh, a friend and colleague of mine, Ariana Spurdy, started an organization specifically focusing on this called Encompass. Um, and it said they're working to make the farm animal protection movement more effective by fostering racial diversity and inclusivity. Um, and they're looking at both organizations and individuals, trying to get organizations to get their act together and trying to help empower individuals. So um, if anyone's more interested in that, they can go to their website, encompassmovement.org. So you may have comments on that, but I just thought I would let folks know that there are some other people working on this. Yeah, I think it's really important to remember there's a lot of women um, who've been, women of color, who've been running organizations in this movement, and they have a lot of value to add, um, and they're not, uh, it, it's not set up that way and to not devalue women who've been already doing this work in this movement, who've been doing it for a long time, and women who are actually credentialed in doing that work. I think it's really important to um, rely on people who've been doing this work for a long time. So I'm going to say that. Okay, thank you. Are we done? Zero. Okay. Um, Thank you all for, for being a wonderful audience for this panel. And I want to remind you tonight at our banquet, please wear your name tags because we will be checking. So thank you and on to, do we have a break now? Okay, let's take a break, get caffeinated, thank you.